Please do so, start. So good afternoon. I'd like to um, first thank the attorneys general and John Palfrey and all the members of the committee and uh, for the great work they're doing here. If they, um, to help protect kids online. So I'm Peter Ferrioli and I'm Director of Operations at NetNanny. Has anyone out here not heard of NetNanny? Okay, so let me dispel everything you do think about it or know about it right now. Um, so NetNanny is, we're basically a parental control tool. We are a tool to help empower parents to block, filter, monitor uh, what their kids are doing online and various aspects of all the different uh, things they do online currently, whether or not that's blocking peer-to-peer -peer downloads, that's blocking inappropriate content, that's bro uh, blocking inappropriate contact, that's managing the time they spend online, um, who they're chatting with, what they're saying, et cetera. So NetNanny was pretty much the very first internet parental control back in circa 92, 93, around when everyone was using Netscape as their browser and Mosaic and those fun days back then. And um, NetNanny, our new version, actually, Net 96, after two and a half years of having the same version out and small versionings coming out, we'll have our next version out next week. So you guys will be the first uh, group to hear about three or four of the killer features that uh, we don't think anyone else is doing in this space and that we're ahead of the game in. We have, just in the last four years, we have about 750,000 plus uh, users, consumers using NetNanny parental controls. So that doesn't take into account from years 1993 to about 2003 when we had the first four versions out. And I hope no one's still using those. If you are, contact me, I'll upgrade you. Um, so we are a very flexible and powerful filter that allows what content uh, is appropriate based on family's em family member's age that comes into their house. We use a patent pending patent pending dynamic contextual analysis filtering engine. Now what does that mean? Well that basically means that unlike the majority of filters out there today that are using list based mechanisms that we find quite antiquated, we use a, an engine, an algorithm that we develop that basically allows us to analyze a page on the fly as it's loaded into the browser, determine its content, and then based on a user's settings, whether they want to block, warn, or allow that page, we can uh, apply that policy to that page and that content. So this is uh, when I was doing these slides and got the template, they asked for some uh, quantitative data here. This is just two recent things when we talk about uh, underblocking and overblocking in our industry. Um, those are two of the key things that like to get thrown around about how effective and ineffective a content filter actually is. Uh, you can see here that um, recently, uh, the, internet, the IIA in Australia tested NetNanny, and you can see some of the results here that on correct blocking, we were 98% and 3% overblocked on websites. And then when we had a, a test just recently, we, we took seven of our competing, competing products out there. We applied the same list of 4,500 websites, and we ran them through all the filters to get accuracy, and we came out with about a 96.2 correct blocking and 4.3% overblocking. And that's just a little bit on just the filter side of what we do. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about NetNanny 6.0 next week, what comes out and some of the things that we're, we're looking forward to. We partnered with the ESRB, so we will be the first desktop software client to actually block PC games based on the ESRB ratings and the content descriptors of those games. So you can choose to play T, game, T for T games, but if you decide within that category that you don't want your children on their PC to play games that have sex, but you're then you can just block sex. If you're okay with violence, you can allow violence. So we've not only based it on the age ratings of the ESRB, which you can select, but we also based it on the content descriptors that the ESRB provides for games. That's one new feature in NetNanny 6.0. Another new feature in NetNanny 6.0 is the ability to filter and block secure proxy websites. Now, this is actually a huge leap forward for us. Over many years and many of these conferences, uh, including ones that deal with the NECC and technology, what you find out is that parental desktop filters have a bad rap because everyone assumes that a child can enter a proxy website, in the, which they do currently with today's most desktop filters in schools, and they can circumvent that filter easily. And they can do that. We have been aggressive with that, uh, that behavior, and our new version will actually block secure proxy websites uh, and we'll be able to actually filter the content and understand what's going on. Currently today, we block 
just proxy websites. We have an algorithm that can determine if a site is a proxy and block it. But we're taking that to the next step and no one on the client side is doing this. This is done right now on an enterprise side. You can see this on some of the back end um, appliance solutions that are done with internet filters and content filters, but you haven't seen it on the client side desktop yet. Uh, those are two of the major features. Another one will be instant message alert and analysis. So we've partnered with, um, well, I wouldn't say partnered with, let's say, we've worked with several uh, criminal, uh, how do I say this, the cyberbullying experts in the, in the US, a couple of them, and criminal professors, and we've taken logs and looked at what cyberbullies do, what they say, we've looked at years of parents who have had kids cyberbullied submitted things to us. We developed an algorithm in NetNanny that allows any instant message application at this point to send an alert if somebody um, uses a word or phrase or in a certain style, if they go back and forth in a, in a conversation in a context of let's say they wanna meet, let's say they're giving racial hatred uh, speech, uh, hate speech, any kind of harassing speech, we can just alert parents via real-time email alert that that's occurring in context, then they can have a conversation with their children. I should step back a little bit. NetNanny does not, we're, we don't install stealth. We're not a stealth mode key logger or anything like that. We're all about educating and open communication between parents and their kids about taking responsibility about what they do online. Now we know that for, I think it's Adam, Adam, some of Adam Thierry's great work back there in parental controls, that only one out of 10 parents who have access to free parental controls today on their cable, their direct TV, their cell phones, their computer, only one in 10 actually uses them. So. People say, oh, well, NetNanny is you know, a subscription product, or if you have to buy something for $39.95. Well, the fact is, is that 90% of people of access aren't using the free ones that they currently have. So what that, what is, what is that, that says a couple things. That says that the ease of use of parental controls and the education are what are very key about parental controls. Uh, lastly, we have a social, net, uh, we have a social da uh, network dashboard that we're rolling out next week. What that will enable a parent to do from any remote place that they are on, at work on their desktop, they can log into their NetNanny account and they can see a little profile of all the different social networks that their kid has gone to, what's changed on there, we can flag items, we can show pictures, um, and we've worked with a couple of those uh, social networks in particular. And am I being Thank you, you are, you are. Okay, That's I great. Thank you, though. I appreciate it, Peter. Stay up, stay up. I know it's particularly hard for those with very mature products such as yours that you've got so many problems you're trying to solve to get it into five minutes, but I appreciate your trying. Um, questions for Content Watch and Net Nandy? How about any of the, yes please, let's get a mic over here and please tell us who you are. Just Tadlock there. I can say one last quick thing about the, the we solved the social networks about the alcohol and tobacco. Well, with NetNanny, you don't have to worry about your kids being exposed to any of that on social networks today. So, My name is Denise Pillow, and I have a small business called Kids Be Safe Online. I educate parents and educators on internet safety and everything about kids and technology. So my question to you is, you talked about the IM alert analysis by keyword selection. Who sets those keyword selections? Well, it, it's actually, keywords are just a small part of it. And... Those, we've taken logs over, over many years from various experts, whether it was based on uh, online predatory behavior or bullying behavior, and we've based the algorithm around a lot of that, around a lot of real world uh, incidents that have occurred and triggers that led up to those and patterns that parents wish they could have seen in the chats previously before uh, harmful incidents occurred to their children or things that got out of their control. So well, it, it's based on a lot of things. It's based about the timing in between the messages, how many times it's coming from them, certain keywords in it are one part of it, for sure. So they are able to select themselves and also you have recommended selections? Uh, no, you can't enter your own keywords. You into cannot. It. No, not currently, okay. you cannot. That was the question. Thank you, I see John Morris has his hand up, but may I defer to someone who has not yet had a chance, or fewer chances? Maybe we'll start back here and we'll come to John. So we'll go Adam, then a uh, gentleman from ChatSafe, and then up to... Uh, just real quick, Peter, you answered this question for me earlier. Maybe you can just tell the crowd how NetNanny handles the new incognito mode in the Google Chrome browser as well as in private browsing in uh, Internet Explorer 8. That, that is a really good that's question. That's an in we, question right there. Yeah, we've been getting that question. I uh, talked to a, a reporter of Times UK, and let's, let's just put this to rest right now. With NetNanny, those modes do not exist. The only thing, what that means is that um, because they're in the incognito mode does not mean with, if you have NetNanny installed, you can still track wherever they've gone through your reporting. 
So we work at the port level, whereas these browsers are working at the browser level. They're, they're, they're basically looking at your history, your cache, the cookies, et cetera, and they're put, putting a report there. So in cognito mode, all this stuff is not tracked or wiped away, but with NetNanny installed, you can still track all the websites that it's visited to, and we do have plans to implement a plugin that would lock the, the private mode out of a browser. So today, with NetNanny, you install it, you can lock Google into safe search mode so your kids cannot get out of safe search mode. We will be doing the same thing when it comes to browsers and the private, and the private uh, ability of those. Great, and I should give, if John Burchett or others from Google want to talk to the Chrome issue at any point, just raise your hand. Uh, sir. Uh, Jim Carmichael, Carmichael Technologies, chat safe. Um, just a question for clarification. If a child is moving to uh, another desktop, to a friend, some more down the street or whatever, um, how, how does NetNanny handle that situation? Uh, well, if my son goes to a neighbor who doesn't have NetNanny, I recommend they put NetNanny on their computer. <laughs> It's a good sales tactic right there. Very well done. Uh, let's go. John Morris, because he's been waiting, and then Larry. And if anybody from the TAB wants to raise their hand, I'll look over there next. But if, let, me, let me just seriously address that for one second. Um, everyone knows about cloud computing and you know, software as a service. And um, we haven't heard a lot about that today. But I'm not going to say that you know, we're quite there yet with that. But to address that issue in particular, that's the way that uh, it looks like it's going to be addressed, no matter where that child goes. Um, hopefully, there's some type of proxy service that if the school's using it, you know, their ISPs are using it, et cetera, that they'd be blocked everywhere if they didn't have a local parental control. But you're not saying you have a cloud computing solution? I am not saying right. that. Great. Just to be clear. Uh, John Morris, CDT. Um, your, your product allows um, various reports to go back to parents about their kids' activity. How many of those reports go through your servers, and what information do you retain about that, if any? That's a great question. So what we do is when a, when a profile is set up on NetNanny, we basically um, put, we, we sync that profile to our backend servers. We only keep any data for 30 days. Every 30 days, all data is purged. We, only, we, we basically only keep chat logs if that feature is selected, if you want to log chat for 30 days, and if you would like to, uh, any URL that was visited, we keep that for 30 days as well, and then those are purged. There, you may have to turn it on from the bottom. Sorry. But let me just say the reason we do that on the back end, we sync it is so that if you have multiple computers, you can then sync that profile out to wherever your child is, where NetNanny is. Hi, Larry Maggot, Connect Safely. Uh, depending on the data you look at, anywhere from, oh, 50 percent to le fewer parents use filtering technology like NetNanny. You guys have been on the market for many years. It's a very mature technology. Why is it that you think that the uptake of the technology across the board is not as high as perhaps some people might expect or might want? Well, it's, uh, it's, there, there's a couple of uh, Education and ease of use. If I can make it those simple words, that's why. With, with great education, like the things you're doing, and some of the NGOs, and with the ease of use of parental controls, for instance, our, next week we release a whole new feature where you just select what age your child is and you'll get a pre-canned set of policy. So, you, so if you choose a young child, you, you put them in a walled garden. If you chose a, a teen and you want to enable them to social network and chat, all those policies would be preset. So we're trying to make it an easier to use product and we're trying to also educate parents about using the product. But what about the possibility that a certain number of parents have thought it through but have decided they don't want it, they don't need it, it isn't necessary, they have other means to keep their kids from doing inappropriate things. I mean, have you looked at those numbers as well? Yeah, but, but we, when we talk about filtering content and doing inappropriate things, this is pretty straightforward, is that a few of the top revenue generators online are pornography, gambling, and prescription pills. Now, I don't know about anybody else out there, but I don't want that content being pushed to me all the time. So when I, when I installed the filter on our, our home and my son says, why'd you put this on there to stop me from doing whatever? It had nothing to do with my son. It has everything to do with protecting the family from content we don't want to come into our house. And I think if everyone understands that, not kind of wants to point filtering at, well, this is going to stop Johnny from, you know, going to playboy.com versus, well, this actually allows us to uh, hold our morals and values in our household and allows it to come in there. You know, it's a, just a different way of looking at it, I think. So go Honey Freed, and then I think Wendy Seltzer is trying to get in on the conversation, be my guest. So we'll go in that order. Um, so we have a 3 to 4% of overblocking. What mechanism uh, do we have once something is overblocked to unblock it? There is, well, so if you come to... Um, 
That's a great question. So we have, a, we have an override situation where either the, the, um, the child using the product is given a over, separate override password by the parent, or we can email in real time the fact that your child wants to access the site, it's been blocked, maybe it shouldn't have. Maybe CNN today is running a story on pornography, and the word pornography is showing up 20 times on CNN, so our filter blocks it. So that day, a child needs to get that article from CNN, they can override it instantly from a password from their parent, or via an email that's sent to their parent in real time. Their parent can do it remotely. Honey, is that responsive? Wendy Seltzer. Uh, thanks. Since the first question that I had was uh, already asked about uh, how many parents might actively be choosing not to use these products, I'll move on to another one, uh, which is how do we prevent these products from sort of preemptively blocking the new and the unseen? As you say, uh, you're developing newer, better technologies to block out the proxies and the circumvention attempts and the places where uh, kids might go to sites that can embed content from other sites or uh, include content that would uh, therefore appear to be uh, a clean URL up top, but uh, in pieces from other sites that the parent has chosen to block. How do you avoid blocking uh, new, new uses of technology? Well, I, I don't think I understand your question completely if you're a, so we have a dynamic engine basically so if you if, if an hour ago you decide to um, post on your blog uh, something about let's just take any one of the categories that we have predefined that we block on let's say it's uh, hate speech or you decide that you don't want your kids to learn about uh, drugs or how to make meth so you decide you're going to block that but you post a blog about it an hour ago that goes to load into the browser, it gets blocked on the fly because we can, we're able to analyze the page and categorize it. So if something is overblocked, we're not that concerned. I mean, we don't overblock things, but we, we would be more concerned if we were underblocking. Overblocking, an override is an easy thing. It's a click of a button to get to the website. And if we underblock, that's bad. We're trying to prevent the exposure in the, in the first place. Wendy, just I, I a tiny, I... tiny follow up and then we'll go. Okay, the, the, the question was, do, do those overblocks a um, interfere with sort of Web 2.0-ish content? No, the, the not with our engine. With a list-based antiquated filter, it does. If I'm using a, a filter that's relying on three million bad known porn URLs that tomorrow are something different, then it's a problem. <laughs> All right, please join me in thanking Content Wat Natnani. And if we could welcome our friends from Symantec. Thank you. And just to be clear, as uh, um, Semantic sets up, we've moved into a, a category we've called here filtering uh, auditing. Again, I'd urge you to look at the submissions um, related to what problems the, each of the providers say they're solving. So all but one, I think, was checked off in the net nanny um, submission. So don't be, um, the fact that we categorize in this way doesn't mean to, um, to limit uh, or to, in fact, um, create any expectation about what it's solving. Sir. Hi, my name is Keith Newstadt. I'm a software developer at Semantic working on Norton Family Safety. Can you get closer to the Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Is that better? So again, I'm Keith Newstadt. I'm a software developer at Semantic. I'm working on Norton Family Safety. Uh, we feel that Norton Family Safety takes a, a different approach to parental controls, um, uh, in large part by focusing on um, providing parents with the tools that they need in order to foster uh, a positive relationship with their, with their kids in the context of online safety. So we all know it's why we're here. We all know that there's a lot of different um, um, dangers that, that uh, face kids as they go online. And that could be anything from accidentally viewing content on the web that's not appropriate for them to uh, being targets of, um, of online predators or cy cyber bullies. So uh, we feel that in combating this, uh, there's a couple of approaches that we need to, to take. I mean, certainly we need to have activity controls at the client on the, the child's machine um, to provide sort of boundaries, you know, things that, that they're not supposed to do versus things that they are expected to do and that they should be allowed to do and that they should be encouraged to do. Um, but at the same time, we, uh, we feel that it's really important to provide the visibility to the parent into the child's online life. Now, so for example, uh, suppose my daughter goes to Google, to Google and starts searching for things that are associated with eating disorders. Now, 
it's probably less important to me that, this, uh, that these searches get blocked than that I'm informed about it, right? So the, the actual response is, is to uh, basically to give me the information I need so that I can open that kind of dialogue with, with my child. So now this idea of visibility is kind of a tricky one because um, uh, parents these days don't have a whole lot of time and, they, and they're not able to provide a physical presence at the child's computer whenever the child is online. Um, and from the parents that we've talked to, uh, a lot of them don't want to, even if they could. They want their kids, particularly the older kids, to feel like they have a sense of privacy in their online life, whether it's browsing the web or talking to their friends. Um, so we feel that it's important that a parental controls application like Norton Family Safety uh, provides the, the parent with the granularity and configuration to, to decide what's the appropriate level of blocking or monitoring for the kid, maybe a younger kid. We monitor everything and we block everything that's inappropriate. Maybe for an older child, um, we monitor less. We give them more privacy. We give them more lee leeway to make their own decisions. Um, but we still want to get notified when something happens that might be an indicator of something that we need to address. So in the end, the goal is to um, provide the parents with tools and the, and the child also with the tools to, to um, create a, a, a relationship with each other that allows them to, um, to, to together make sure that the child is, is, is safe online. So this is how it would work. The, uh, the parent goes to the Norton Family Safety website and sets up an account and defines their family. Then the parent sits down with the child and together they define the rules. So this is full disclosure. The child knows um, what's expected of them, uh, what kind of monitoring is gonna be in place. This is not spyware, right? Um, in the meantime, the child also gets a, a sense of ownership of the process. They're there to try to influence the rules. And there's a certain a, a level of, um, of buy-in that they've agreed to these rules. When they go back to their computer, they can at any time uh, view basically that contract uh, that they agreed to that defines what their parents' expectations of are, uh, uh, are of them when they're online. So now the, the child goes back to their own computer and they, they uh, engage in the activities that they usually do, browsing the web, searching the web, chatting with their friends, um, using social networks. Um, but in the meantime, the parent has the ability to, from wherever they are, um, whether it's another computer in the home or uh, maybe from work, they have the ability to um, get a sense of what's going on for the child in their online, online life and to get notifications if something uh, maybe problematic comes up. So suppose that the child goes to uh, a website that they're not supposed to, something that they've agreed that they're not, they're not going to go to. Well, the parent's going to get a notification and has the opportunity to, again, open up that dialogue, has the information to open up that dialogue. Uh, at the same time, the child is informed that they've done something that transgresses this, this contract that they have. Um, and they have an opportunity to also open up the dialogue with their parent about that. Now, maybe for a younger child, they actually get blocked. They actually can't go see that website. And so they've got an opportunity to, you know, maybe type in a note to their parent to say, uh, sorry, I didn't know what I was clicking on. It's an accident. And that's going to show up in the logs for the parent in the parent's console so they get a, a little bit more context. Um, or if it's an older child, maybe the, the parent has decided that, um, that they're going to give the child the leeway to make their own decision. Well, they're still going to get a notification. The child is still going to get a notification on the client saying, um, uh, you're doing something that might not be appropriate. Um, are you sure you want to do this? And again, the child has the opportunity to open up a dialogue with their parent. This is the reason I'm going here. Maybe it was an accident. I clicked on a link. I didn't know where I was going to go. Or maybe there's um, actual content that I validly need to access to do schoolwork. And they also have the opportunity to request permission to go see that site if they're blocked. And again, the parent, from wherever they are, maybe at work, they get the notification. Um, they can see what's going on. They get the context. There's that dialogue that's opened up. They can choose whether or not to allow the request or deny the request. And again, it's about providing the parent with the tools that they need to understand what the child is doing online and um, whether or not there's something that they need to do to, to personally intervene. So, um, and then beyond that, again, there's a focus on providing parents with the tools that they need in order to parent. So 
also access to uh, forums where parents can share ideas and, and, uh, and issues, um, access to other online content that, that, uh, that helps parents with this task of parenting uh, in an online world. Great, thank you so much for this uh, overview. Do you mind if I use moderator's prerogative and ask the first question? Um, sure. one of the, we've uh, had the target, again, of our inquiry on social network sites, but we're talking about it more broadly. And I appreciate very much that you're looking at instant messaging and other kind of environments that we might have concern with. But can you maybe just talk to the social network um, example? And let's imagine that I, with my child, set up this arrangement to uh, limit what he or she could do within the social network. What are the kinds of constraints that this product would place on, on his or her activity? Right. So I'm, I'm going to have to apologize up front. We're, we're still um, sort of de in the depths of development, and we're still haggling over uh, what features are in and out. So um, there's, there's some things I'm not going to be able to be specific about. Okay. But for, and this for is social, one of them? For social networking, I, I can still answer your question. Okay, okay. Thanks. So for social networking, um, at the, the <laughs> sorry. So for social networking, um, certainly there's going to be uh, uh, parts of the, the, this contract that are going to define, for example, which sites the parent is comfortable with the child visiting and which sites they're not. Um, we're also going to be monitoring to see which sites the, the child is using, not just for browsing, but which sites they actually have accounts on. Um, and we'll be collecting information, again, configurable by the parent uh, about you know, what the site is, what the URL is, what their screen name is. Uh, you know, the age that they're purporting to be on that site, that sort of thing. So again, the goal is to give the parent enough information to create that dialogue. So maybe the parent has blocked access to a particular, um, to a particular social networking site. The child has the opportunity to ask for permission, right? Maybe the child has permission to get to a, a certain social networking website, um, but has created multiple accounts when they're only really supposed to have one. Well, the parent is going to know this. Right, and is going to have the opportunity to engage in that conversation, um, and in particular to make sure that that they're on the child's friend list, that the that they've got visibility into what's going on. Got it. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll start with Teresa, unless there's someone. Oh, Scott Bradner has not yet spoken, which is extraordinary. Other than having people come to the mic, and we'd like to hear from him. Tell us who you are, Scott. Scott Bradner, one of the tab members, work for Har work for Harvard. Um, how much research have you done to? gauge the level of ongoing parental involvement in, in this sort of thing. It could be quite a bit of ongoing effort. Uh, about how, how much, how much effort is, is required for well, No, how, how many parents, what percentage of parents stick with it? Uh, well, uh, so we're a version one product. Okay. Right? So, so we, the answer is we, not much yet. Well, we, so we've done research in, 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 uh, in talking to parents about what they're looking for and the types of things that we found is that um, you know, there were, a question came up earlier, why, isn't, why aren't parental controls being adopted more? And, um, and I, I think that, that uh, a lot of the other reasons that, that came up uh, apply, but I think that, that one of them that hasn't come up yet is that uh, parents are, are hesitant to be viewed as, as spying on their kids, right? Maybe, particularly as, as kids get, get older. Um, and then another reason is that the amount of information that you get when you are monitoring in detail what a kid is doing is a little bit overwhelming, particularly to a parent who may, might not be as technically savvy as the child. Right? So, you know, list and list and list of, of URLs and search terms, and they don't necessarily know what that means. So it's, it's a little bit overwhelming. So um, what we've gotten is that parents of younger children really want to be able to constrain what the kids can do and to have full visibility into it, whereas Parents of older children want to give want to give the the, the child um, more free reign, more freedom, more privacy, but they still want to get notified. They don't want to see everything, but they still want to get notified when there's something that they might want to address. Again, the example of uh, of the girl who's searching for terms associated with the, with eating disorders. I don't want to block that. I want to know about it. Yeah, I, the reason I ask is not that. I, I completely agree with you. This is the kind of thing that parents would say they wanted. The question is, how well would they stick to it? And so, because your product is new, it's, it's hard to tell. But it, it's certainly one of the areas of worry. Something to monitor. Teresa Polaris. Teresa Polaris from Polytechnic University of NYU. You had mentioned in uh, one of your slides that 
in stark contrast to other approaches, and you were emphasizing your reliance on the parental involvement and monitoring. How are you doing that uh, in a way that's different, say, from the example before with Net Nanny? I, I, th I think that it's, um, I, I think it's, it's in large part to the, the way we approach the problem, right? Um, uh, this, the, the context of an online world is new, right? Um, children going out and interacting with other people online, um, engaging behaviors that might not be appropriate, uh, exchanging information that might not be appropriate. But this is kind of an old problem. This is something that existed before the internet, which is basically parents asking themselves, "I know how I parent my, I know how to parent my kid when I'm there. You know, how do I parent my kid when they're out in the world?" Right. So, a, a lot of it is about the approach, and a lot of it is about um, providing tools that, you know, it's it's not about installing an agent on, on the child's machine and laying down the law and saying, these are the rules that I'm imposing on you. It's about making sure there's a continual back and forth discussion between the parent and the child and having the software facilitate that. So um, what the child is doing online and how effective the rules are, how appropriate the rules are, uh, a, a continual conversation. I, I guess my question Teresa, was, rel was okay. relating to how does the package support that, though? Um, with, you know, and again, uh, I'm going to apologize for being vague, but, but um, uh, with certain workflow items, like, uh, like the child being able to see, a, you know, a natural language view of, of what their contract is and what they've agreed to, which, um, which uh, experts in the field of, of parenting online say is very important. Also, workflow that, that uh, allows children and parents to communicate within the context of the parental controls, right? The web page doesn't just come up and say you can't do this. The web page comes up and says you're doing something you're not supposed to do. Why is that? Let's engage. Brian Levine of UMass. Thank you. Uh, so I want to really applaud the approach of uh, integrating parents into this. I think that's that's great. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question about data security. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems that uh, the information you gather about children and so on is is in a central location stored. Uh, with Symantec, and I, I guess that's because you want parents to be able to access those logs from work, say, things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, how long is that data kept, and can parents delete it upon request, and is that information ever sold to third parties? So again, on, on the specifics, um, I'm not going to be exactly sure with what we come up with. Uh, uh, certainly the, the data is going to be purged regularly. Um, the data will never be sold. Uh, semantic, this is not the only scenario where, where semantic um, keeps customer data in the cloud for them, right? And it's it, not even in, in consumer products. I mean, we, we've, we've done it for a long time in, uh, in enterprise products, too. So this is something that we're familiar with. We certainly don't collect any information um, without permission. The parent always has the option to turn off at, at a pretty good granularity what's being stored, what's not, right? And, um, and you know, and we, we've got lots of experience on how to make sure that that data is secure when we've when, when it's in our possession. So is it typical if there was a data breach at Symantec that you would notify your customers? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say this, and maybe I'm going to get slammed. I, I, I don't believe that that's happened yet. That so you've notified them or that you've had the breach? That we've had the breach. But I would assume yes. I would assume yes. But, okay. but uh, uh, that's with the caveat. I'm, 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 a, I'm a software developer. I'm a, yes. Yes. yes, all right. Yes. The crew from Symantec <laughs> steps Thank up. You. Thank you, Owen. Thank that you. away. That's, that's this is good. Clarity, defensive, uh, Jeff Smith. <laughs> this is, okay. Has that information ever been subpoenaed? Has, um, I, I actually, Questions sorry, are getting I harder. No. Yeah. Um, I, well, that, that's yeah. actually an easy one for me. I, I have no idea. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Do you guys care to respond? Or? Okay. That may also, for lawyers, be hard to answer, even if it were so. Um, <laughs> Professor Harry Lewis author of Blown to Bits, which if you have not read it, you ought to. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm a computer science professor at Harvard. I'd just like to um, offer, not for your, not, this is not aimed at you, it's aimed at a number of the comments that have been uh, made in the discussion of why parents don't use these monitoring tools, whether covert or overt, as uh, yours are, and I certainly agree that of the, of the two, the open posture you've taken is preferable. But, there are parents who simply believed that the developmentally more healthy way to um, have a trusting relationship with your child 
is to have the child understand that the child has certain privacy that the parents will not, in fact, invade. Um, and that the attempts to monitor, since they will inevitably be circumvented by going down the street or whatever, is better assured to the child from the first place. And the discussion which the parent and the child need to have is about the responsibilities that are being placed on both parties by um, having that happen. So it's not so much fear or avoidance or many of the other sort of negative externalities that have been associated with, with that, but it's actually an attempt to help children grow up. I think it's worth noting that in addition to being a parent, he is also the former dean of Harvard College. So we had 6,400 such charges under his, <laughs> under his giving. Do you want to respond to this or, or others who may have uh, been invoked? All I can say is that, that, uh, that I totally agree. We, we very much agree. Great. Any other questions? I feel the energy sapping slightly from the room after all these great presentations. But I uh, will do one more from Larry, and then, uh, then we'll move forward. First of all, I want to ditto that last comment. That was the nature of my question earlier. Um, the other issue is, to the extent to which this is going to be effective, it's going to be effective in families where the parent is actively engaged in their children's life. And ironically, that's probably the place where it's least needed, or where some form of protection is least needed. And so I, I know you're an engineer, and I, and, and I know you, you can't solve every problem in the world, but. I wonder if you could at least talk about the child who comes from a home where the parents are unable or unwilling uh, or just simply ill-equipped to provide supervision. Uh, the very homes where, where, to the extent that online predation is a risk, the very homes where it, it, apparently there may be some risk, um, what do we do about the folks that you know, aren't going to rush over to Best Buy uh, to spend money and spend time to supervise their parents? There's, there's a lot of parents in that category. So, so you're asking, how do we protect children whose parents don't buy not, your service? Are, are not? Yeah, maybe that's not a fair question for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to redirect it, if that's okay. I, can can I send Esther Hargitay? Do you mind being on the spot for a moment if I rephrase the question for you? So, um, you. sorry, and and maybe I'll welcome the. Actually, let's thank Symantec. Um, it's very helpful. Um, welcome, McGruff, to the podium. And while you sit, sit up, thank you. I'm going to ask Esther Hargitay, um, someone who's done a huge amount of study, um, as of Dana and others, particularly on this question of the participation gap in terms of the skills that kids have and whether or not kids may be on SES lines or maybe otherwise, if you're willing to go down that road, um, may be more or less at risk. And um, It's definitely the case that so I've studied differences in uh, young users' skills. And there, first of all, there are huge differences in what... Uh, younger users understand about the web. Um, so while on average younger users are more knowledgeable than older adults, there are huge differences among them. And as John cited, these tend to be along lines of socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender. Um, so you can't assume that all young users are very savvy. And it is systematic as to who is more or less savvy. Um, so. Uh, this does raise concerns because SES, uh, one way I measure SES is parental education. And so what you have is uh, kids who are in families where parents have lower levels of education, the kids themselves understand the web less. So the fear there would be that the parents would understand these risks less themselves and the kids themselves would be more uh, prone to those issues. But I'm afraid I haven't really worked on solutions to those. My area is more direct trying to figure out how, what we can do through training, but that's actually a really tricky issue itself. Esther's got tons of great data, relatively fresh from the field, and to the extent you want to dig into that, I know she'll be, be around. McGruff, thank, thank you so thanks, much for Sean. being here. Hi, my name's Marty Schultz, and I'm with McGruff Safeguard. I want to kind of reiterate what the Attorney General said this morning, which is that no solution is perfect, and we need to empower the parents to keep their kids safe online. And that's what we do. We give parents a simple, uh, free, easy to use tool that empowers them to keep their kids safe. Um, the problem, we believe, is not just age verification because even if we verify the kid's age, they'll figure out some way to get around the verification. The problem is not the internet or social networks. We, we can't stop progress and social networks are beginning to become a fabric of society. 
The problem is not the existence of bad guys out there, because there are bad guys, and that's just a reality that we have to live with. The problem is parental ignorance and parental apathy. Parents don't know how to keep those kids safe online. That's, the, that's what we're all fighting about here. So our solution is to give parents the ability to monitor their kids online, just like they monitor kids in the real world. We have an intelligent virtual parenting service. It's free, it's from a trusted brand, and it alerts parents to potential danger. We knew in order to get massive desktop adoption out there amongst all people, it had to be free, it had to be trusted, the McGruff brand is very well trusted, and it had to be, as we've all pointed out, very, very simple to use. So how do we use the product? You sign up for an account for free at the McGruff website, you download and install a little applet on your kid's PC, McGruff monitors everything coming and going on the kid's PC so we see exactly what the kid is doing. And then if there's ever a problem, the parent is alerted via email or a cell phone text message that there's a problem. The parent signs into the website and sees what the kid's doing. We monitor everything, email, website, chat, social networks, you name it, we're doing it. A typical, when a parent first signs up, they say what kind of behaviors concern themselves about their child. Do they want to watch out for sexual predators? Do they want to watch out for drugs? Do they want to watch out for self-destructive behavior? They put in that profile, and then McGruff Safeguard will watch out for those activities. Here's an example from, the, from one of our customers where the kid used the word hot ice in a conversation. What McGruff Safeguard did was it noticed that's a term for crystal meth, sent a cell phone message to the parent saying, hey, you better get into the website and look what your kid's talking about because this could be potentially dangerous. The parent logs in, sees the conversation, and then has the conversation with the child to avoid a potentially dangerous issue with crystal meth. Now, before we go there, what we notice is now we have tens of thousands of parents coming to visit the, web, the McGruff Safeguard website every day to see what their kids are doing. We realize we have a community of parents who are watching out and really care about their children. So we said, why don't we take the power of that community and use it to stop sexual predators from targeting the children. So we added another feature, which is now covered by a patent we just got a few months ago, where let's say John sees a predator talking to his daughter. And he reviews the conversation and said, this, yes, this is a real predatory incident. Pushes a little button saying, report predator. At that point, we put John through a vetting process, calling him up, talking about it. And if we determine that this is a real report, not only do we block that predator from communicating with his daughter, we block that predator from talking to any other child protected by McGruff Safeguard. At the same time, we initiate a real criminal investigation by passing this information over to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. So by working together and, taking, and harnessing the combined power of all these parents who are watching over their children, we've kind of changed the tables on the sexual predators. They're no longer swimming in a sea of anonymity, which they are today. We're having tens of thousands of parents who are watching out for them, able to stop them, report them to the police, and protect their kids. We believe that parents need to monitor what their kids are doing online as the same way they do in the real world. We believe that monitoring needs to be simple and smart. And we believe that the social networking firms and the chat firms who provide these uh, methods for kids to talk to each other need to cooperate with the security firms like ourselves and Net Nanny and Spectrosoft. In essence, our request is really open up channels so that we can help parents see what their kids are doing online. Um, I guess if we had one major uh, request here for some of the social network companies to take away, excuse my notes is that if we can cooperate, the, the companies who are in the parent parental control market and the people who provide social networking and provide these venues for parents to see what their kids are doing, it'll make the kids safer online. And I know in some cases that it's a business, thre business threat for parents to see everything their kids are doing, but we think that threat is worth, that, that risk is worth taking to keep the kids safer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions for McGrath? 
we'll maybe start with Scott over there, and then we'll do the um, Larry and John show over here after that. The same questions are asked of the other folks that uh, do a centralized collection. How long do you keep it? Who, who, do you have, who has access to it? Um, the, the, has it ever the been subpoenaed? The data is stored encrypted. It's kept for 30 days. Parents can delete it at their own uh, volition. And has it ever been? Um, it's never been compromised. Has it never been uh, subpoenaed? Never been subpoenaed. Um, we if, believe you're, if you're using it indirectly to um, engage law enforcement on on to track down predators, do you offer, do you provide any of that data to the law enforcement? We've been advised by the National Crime Prevention Council and our other law enforcement uh, assistants, because we partner with them, um, that we are a remote storage facility, and if the parent chooses to give this data to the police, they can. But that wasn't the question I asked. Do you, do you provide, in the context of bringing in law enforcement, do you provide any of this data to the law enforcement, we, or do you just provide a, a, a screen name for the predator. The uh, we provide the information to the to the parent. We assist them in filing the police report, and then we let the parent gain access to their own data. We basically give them the tools, then get out of the way so as not to mess up the investigation. So you don't fi you don't file a report. The parent does. The report is filed on behalf of the parent. By you, the parent initiates it through you. Yeah. In other words, they push the button, and our our servers talk to Nick Mix servers. As, and the parent is the one whose name is on the report. And, and it, but I'm just trying to ascertain how clear it is. What information is being provided to law enforcement when the parent presses the button? Does the parent have control over that? If so, how clean is the control? It's the standard form that uh, Nick Mick has up on their cyber tip line. So it's the same information that's collected there. No? Okay, I'll just use this. Other questions from anybody? Yes. Sure. Did we have? So did <laughs> John Morris from CDT. Um, so in the collaborative process, um, if, if you receive a report that a certain user is a predator and you receive it from two or three different McGruff users, but you're not able to reach them to verify it, I mean, what will you do with, with that kind of report? In other words, I mean, how much of a denial of service attack is risk is there um, through that system? If a parent chooses not to go through the vetting process or aborts the vetting process and wishes not to file, in essence, a false police report, it basically gets held. If we notice a pattern there, we'll certainly contact the vendor from which that conversation came, be it a Facebook, a MySpace, an MSN, or an AIM, to notify their security desks. But that's not enough for us to actually turn the report over to NCMEC or law enforcement. I think we've had about eight reports filed off to NCMEC. Eight reports came into us, and about three have been forwarded off to NCMEC. I don't know what happened from that point. Three have actually gone, gone the full process. Yes. Out of how many thousands of users? Out of tens of thousands of users. Okay. Do we have further back here, Jeff? not-for-profit, is, is there a revenue model here or is this all funded by, I mean, there's a lot of- We are an affiliate of the National Crime Prevention Council, McGruff. We are a for-profit organization. McGruff Safeguard is a for-profit corporation. We're an affiliate of the National Crime Prevention Council. The business model is an upgrade model where the product is given away for free and some percentage of the parents choose to get some additional features for a small amount of money. Okay. Okay. So just to clarify, and Jim Carmichael, chat say, um, step number one there is the result of the parent being diligent enough to monitor and see that, that there are um, telltale signs in the, in the exchanges. Is Our correct? software has linguistic analysis built in to detect predatory trends. So we would send an alert to the parent saying, we know you haven't come to the website for two months because you think everything's okay, but we just detected an incidence that follows the... Um, the yeah. patterns of grooming. Excellent. All right. Are there any other questions from the audience? Sure. Did you say it's... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Sahara Byrne from Cornell University. 
Did you say that it was human? It's humans who are monitoring it, or is it some sort of software or, or algorithm? Our, our software does linguistic analysis to monitor it to okay. warn parents that they better go in and, and verify what we're assuming is so going it's on. Software through linguistic. Anyone else? Others? All right. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay, welcome KB up. Absolutely. We've made up a few minutes. It's sort of amazing. Okay. Um, hopefully the energy Fen will return to the room. As Absolutely. Soon as Anybody needs to do jumping jacks, please feel free. More okay, coffee in the back. I think let's just keep, keep on, on and encourage people to um, stick with us. Okay, my name is Paul Reamer. I'm the CEO of KB Technologies. I'd like to thank John and the rest of the task force for inviting us to, uh, to talk with you today. Um, also, thanks, John, for limiting us to three slides. If, uh, if we had our own way, we'd really have uh, PowerPoint overload. Um, I'm here today to talk about KB, a company based in San Francisco. Um, we were formed two years ago this month when we saw how social media publishers were having trouble coping with the tremendous amount of user-generated content that was coming into their sites. Now, while these publishers were happy to get all this action, including the revenue that goes along with it, um, the methods that they put in place to protect their users from inappropriate content um, were sometimes an afterthought and, and frankly not very effective and not very scalable. When you think about it, these companies could meet all three of their business objectives, which are really uh, safety, member experience, and monetization, if they could do a simple thing, which is enforce their own terms of service. Um, after all, the terms of service expressly prohibit all the types of things that everybody in this room is, is concerned about. So enforcing them really would be the key to, to this. Um, recognizing this, KB's mission has always been quite simple. We want to help social media companies. Um, uh, we want to provide them with the best technologies for helping them to enforce their terms of service. So in September of 2006, we started developing our KB moderation suite. And two years and about uh, 25 man years of development later, um, KB is becoming the de facto independent standard for content moderation in terms of service enforcement. At its heart, the KB Moderation Suite is a workflow solution that enhances human moderation teams' ability to get through content accurately and quickly. And these human moderation teams can be employees of our customers. They can be outsourced firms either in the U.S. or offshore or they can even be KB people that are provided as part of a complete solution to these customers. <clears throat> and here's how it works. Our customers connect to our system through a very simple API. Typically takes uh, just a few days to get this integration to work. Um, then content is fed into the KB system uh, via the API where it's analyzed and queued up for action by the human moderators. The decisions of the moderators, such as accept, reject, blacklist, whitelist, are then passed back to our customer servers where they can take whatever action they, they deem appropriate, which is typically delete the content, remove the user, and in extreme cases, notify authorities that a user has, uh, has gone bad. But the real interesting work is um, happening behind the scenes within the KB application servers. So let me explain the analysis and scoring a little bit more. First of all, we take in all types of user-generated content, um, text, videos, and, um, and images. And uh, along with also, I'm sorry, we also get the unique user ID from our customer. That gets sent over and is associated in our system with the items that have been uploaded. And it turns out that knowing a, a lot of information, if, as, as much as we can, about the user that's uploading the information is more important to our technology than looking at the individual pieces of content, which we do as well. Next, we automatically grade each piece of content against the typical abuse categories such as uh, cyberbullying, racism, and pornography. Um, we continue to adjust the, the user's KB holistic score, uh, looking at other signals from the social graph, such as their friend scores, uh, community flags of their content, and their own past violations. 
the weights can be adjusted on a per customer basis. For example, one of our customers has discovered that most of the pornography is uploaded by males ages 15 to 25 from a particular country. So we're able to bump up the, the, uh, the KB score from that demographic in order to ensure that that content is more likely to be put up in front of the human moderators quicker. The KB system also learns over time um, and is able to get better at helping companies enforce their own particular terms of service. Since launching our system um, at the end of last year, KB's acquired uh, 15 customers across the social network spectrum. Um, and we are processing several million pieces of user-generated content per day with our, with our tool. Um, we're in conversations with virtually all established um, social networks as well as quite a few startups that are uh, safety-focused social networks that need a technology like ours in order to even launch their sites. Our goal is to have about 30 customers by the end of this year. So what does all this analyzing and scoring do to foster a safer social media environment? The bottom line is it allows social networks to remove most of the inappropriate content and users from their systems without having to actually look at all the content. Um, this chart shows a couple of, uh, couple of examples of this effect. In the upper example, 55% of the total content is reviewed, first by humans using only homegrown tools that don't prioritize the content, and second by humans using the KB solution. In this case, 72% more problematic content is found using KB. The effect is even more dramatic um, for a customer who can only look at 30% of their content. Um, in this case, 179% more inappropriate content is found using this prioritiz prioritization and, and scoring methods that I talked about. The other point on this slide is a little bit more qualitative. Um, we found that a mid-sized social network using three moderators can uh, successfully identify and remove 70 to 80% of the inappropriate content. Um, with three moderators, and by adding a fourth, they could significantly improve this, but ultimately they're going to make a cost-benefit um, decision on, uh, that's based on what's appropriate for their community. Um, let me com conclude by answering two questions in advance. Um, first of all, KB is a Japanese word for sentinel or guardian, and second, our biggest challenge in our market is to get MySpace and Facebook as customers. Happy to take other questions. Paul, thank you very much. Questions for KB? Let's see. Ah, great, Lam. Start over there. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's Lam Wen with Strauss Friedberg. I'm a TAB member. Uh, the, the screen you have up there talks about how effective KB can help in uh, identifying additional bad content for the reviewers. Do you have any statistics on the amount of false positives that you're generating, and how does that help or dissuade your potential customers? Because you're either asking them to review a lot more content that's not necessary to review, or is that uh, a selling point of your product, and what are you telling your clients? Yeah, well, we've done a fair amount of analysis. Again, we haven't been in the market that long, and we're starting to collect some pretty good um, some pretty good data, but what we're finding is the techniques that I've described, and we actually have a patent pending on this aggregation of all these different signals, has the effect of bubbling up, the, we'll call it the bad content, to the top of the queue. So it's not so much a question of false positive, because there is subjectivity. Um, p different uh, social networks have different terms of service. You know, bikini-clad women are, are taboo in some and not in others, um, but by Looking at these images, we're able to provide, to give them a head start and make them more productive. What we found, though, is that if a, if a social network will look at about between 50 and 55 percent, of, I'll use images as an example, of, of all the images, they'll be able to remove about 87 to 90 percent of the problematic images of, across their entire network. So at about 50 percent, it gets close to the human error rate for, for another firm looking at 100 percent of the content. Paul, thank you. I see both John and Teresa would like to speak, but others who have had less airtime. Oh, please. Hi, I'm Ron from eGuardian. Just a question. What's been the biggest obstacle with uh, when you've spoken to MySpace and Facebook? Is it getting in to talk to them, or is it just not a willingness to do this? No. Um, they, they, 
both of those companies have a tremendous will to do this and get it right, but they also have significant development staffs of their own. So unlike the next tier of networks down, which would include the you know, high fives, friendsters, um, and so on, uh, those companies would, would probably rather not put their core developers onto doing systems Great. like ours. So tomorrow we'll hear from both MySpace and Facebook for anybody in a public session in the morning. And let's, if we can, just keep this more or less on the technical front and we can ask those questions of them tomorrow. They have like. a lot of engineers. Thanks. Uh, Teresa, then John. Actually, Lon asked my question. So Fabulous. Even present. better. John Morris of CDT. Nice work, Lon. Thanks. So, um, what, what user information do you gather? And, and am I right in understanding that, that is the review happening on your, comp your servers or your customers' servers? So uh, that, those are really two questions. How, right. much, how, how much user information do you gather, keep, and how long do you keep it? Okay. The only actual user information, is, as you described it, is, a, is an encrypted unique user ID that we can't, that is, basically provides no identifiable information whatsoever. Um, now, having said that, the, you know, the images that come into our system, which is hosted by us, we're a SaaS model, um, we have a subscription-based model, those images are analyzed within our servers, They're, the results are delivered to the moderators wherever they happen to be, and then the images are removed from our servers um, typically within 30 days. We keep a thumbnail around for QA so that their moderators, managers can go back and look at it and see if the right decisions were made. Thanks, Paul. Others for KB? Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Tate, and I'm the Director of Product Management at Spectrosoft Corporation. We're based out of Vero Beach, Florida. Uh, we've been in the monitoring business uh, for quite some time, almost 10 years. And our products uh, are very mature and really cater to parents who are, uh, you know, really have a, a concern about their children and what they're doing on, on their computers and on the internet. And I can tell you, you know, the, the thing about education is so key, uh, and, and it's really a challenge for everyone, especially parents, uh, to, be, to find out, you know, about these uh, technologies, even though they may not be uh, technically savvy. And that, I think we, we find that a lot at Spectrosoft when we're talking to our customers. They're just intimidated. So that drives us to create products that are very easy to install and very easy to use. I mean, the, the, the nature of the product itself is, is, is really dirt simple. And uh, education is, is, is key on the parental side, but I think it's also very important on the, the child side. Um, just to give you an overview of uh, our products, we'll get into that a little bit uh, more in just a moment. Uh, we have uh, several products on the consumer side. We also have an enterprise product that caters to uh, uh, businesses, and that's uh, Spectre 360, but we won't go into that today. Um, our consumer products are Spectre Pro and eBlaster, and we also have uh, Spectre for Mac, and I think we're one of the only companies uh, currently providing a monitoring solution for Mac computers. Uh, the, the total deployment of our products are roughly uh, 400,000 uh, worldwide, and we record practically everything that they do on their computer. And, and that goes from, you know, their website visits to when they go to MySpace, who the pictures they're downloading, uh, the, the keystrokes, everything they do, okay, chat, IM, uh, the, the file downloads. Uh, they, they change something on their screen, for instance. Uh, I, I actually use the product for my own children. I have a 10-year-old at home and a 15-year-old. And recently, my 15-year-old had a Tommy gun, you know, on his screensaver. And I saw this pop up. We, have, we actually record screen snapshots, and you can play them back in a, uh, an application that has VCR-like controls. So you could do fast forward or reverse it, start over, replay. And every event has an associated um, action, so you can actually jump to the screen snapshot that, that surrounds those events and look and see what happened leading up to it. But getting back to the Tommy Gunn story, you know, I, I have the relationship with my son such that I can go and talk to him. I have an open you know, line of communication. He knows he's being monitored. I said, this just doesn't look very good to have a machine gun on your screensaver, Jordan. What, you know, what are you up to? And we talk about it, and it's a collaborative thing, and there's trust there. So I think, you know, there, there's also the uh, approach of not informing your child that you're monitoring them, and that's kind of difficult because when something does go wrong, how do you inform them that they're doing something wrong? And then at that point in time, they feel like they're being, you know, 
uh, there's some lack of trust there and they feel like you, you don't belong on my computer. So I think, I, I personally promote the fact that uh, telling your child is, is important. We also have, uh, well actually let me just uh, step through this. We have s uh, been awarded several um, um, accolades throughout the press and industry uh, trade press. Uh, we've, uh, um, as you can see, there's PC Edit Editor's Choice. Uh, twice we've been awarded that, the uh, Gold Award as well. And uh, we continue to receive these accolades through time. And it's just testament to the, the maturity of the product um, and again, the, you know, the fact that it's, it's so, so easy to install and, and, uh, and simple to use, very intuitive. And, and just some of the things that Pro can do. Um, if, if, for instance, a child misrepresents themselves. Okay, there are a lot of products, there are a lot of uh, technology that we heard about today where it's preventing these type of things or it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's more of a blocking type thing. We're more into monitoring. If a child repeats these behaviors, the parent can see that. So, okay, they could go to that site once and, and maybe it was a mistake. But if they keep going to it day in and day out, we're going to show you that as a parent and then let you react accordingly. And we also have a product called eBlaster. E I love eBlaster because my, my son is right now in Boca Raton, Florida, typing away, and I'm getting his eBlaster reports to my PDA. So no, ma no matter where I am in the world, okay, I'm able to keep in touch and connected to where, what my son's doing. He's, hey, Dad's on a business trip. I'm going to go to this website or I'm going to go to that website. No, I've got the PDA right here. I can see everything they're doing uh, from a million miles away. So that, that's, a, that's really a, a great, uh, great feature of the eBlaster product is an intuitive report that's emailed to, to you and it's uh, very, very useful and, and very easy to understand and, and, and uh, go through. The other thing that we do are keyword alerts. So for example, if a child is typing in uh, profanity or uh, let, let's say your credit card number, okay, they go into, the, into mom's purse and pulls out the credit card and starts typing that away to buy some music or uh, iTunes for example, you get an alert and you can know right away and intervene. And so I think that's, uh, that's a really important feature as well. Um, eBlaster as well has received several of these uh, same awards uh, and just a recap of the features are on this slide, which are also included in your handout. Um, just as in summary, these, these are the products and, and also our Spectre Mac uh, product as well. Any questions? Andrew, thank you very much. Start with Scott Bradner and then uh, Hani Farid and take it from there. The same question uh, asked earlier. Um, do you have any research to show how well parents stick to this, considering there's an awful lot of data potentially, how, lo how well they deal with this over ongoing? Well, in terms of uh, their, their staying with the product, you mean? In staying with the actual responding to your messages. Yeah, well, they do, they do stay with it because uh, we continually update them. And we know that they, you know, we, we have uh, a great rapport with our customers as follow-up. So we, we definitely see, you know, the customers staying in touch and using the product through time because we're, our product's right. not static. It has to, you know, it has to conform to, like, different events that occur or different features that are provided by mainly webmail. We see a lot of changes in webmail strings and that sort of thing. So, yes, we do find that customers stay with the product and, so and are consistent over time. Percentage-wise, you say you had 400,000 customers, you said? 400,000 customers. So what percentage, of the, what percentage of those have stuck with it for um, six months? Oh, I, I would say probably close to 95%. I don't have any hard statistics, but it's definitely, we, we see a definite positive trend there. Okay. Thank you, honey. Um, so we've been hearing a lot of the filtering and auditing and monitoring, and I, this is more of a clarification. It sounds like you're more in the monitoring, so there's no, like you're just giving the parent all the information and let them deal with it, or are you doing some quote-unquote intelligent filtering? Because, I mean, a kid spends hours on a computer, and that can generate just a huge amount of data, especially if you're taking screenshots. Well, it does, but the thing of it is is that we categorize this data. So it's statistically presented to the, to the parent. So in some condensed format that doesn't take them an hour to yeah, sort through. Well, I mean, for instance, like the websites, we give them top 10 reports of the top 10 websites that they've gone to or the top 10 chats that they've been participating in. And those, those are the type of statistics that parents are really after because they can go bubble up to the top. Where are my kids spending the most of their time? And furthermore, we allow you to, 
do blocking, okay, based on those sites. So for instance, if a child is going to a particular site that's not desirable, you can just say block the site from, from future access. And we do other, have other controls as well, like block certain chat IDs, or even provide uh, you know, times of when they can use the computer. For instance, if they come home, as soon as they get home from school, they start you know, typing away, that's not desirable. So we give them, let's say, six to eight at night that they can use their computer. And that's something that's built into the program as well. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Others for Spectrosoft. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do we have a mic this way? Thanks. Start with the gentleman from NetNanny, then John Morris will get his question. Just a quick question. Is there, is there a way to, just a, is there a, is there a way to, to prevent and a child from installing this on their parents' computer to capture their admin password and stuff like that? Well, the, you know, the, this is all going back to the education thing. Okay, a parent shouldn't have their administrator uh, password out in the open to a child. So you need administrative rights to do this, and I think that it's important that you know uh, parents are educated and, and understand how to manage their computers. Um, that's that's again part of this this whole process, and I think a lot the people in this room are going to be key moving forward in making that you know that uh, knowledge available to the, the community at large. John Morris, CDT. Same question as before with other folks. Um, how long do you keep um, all the data that you're, you're the, the pretty massive amount of data that you're collecting, um, and do you do, do you do anything with it beyond? Well, uh, we don't house the data at Spectrosoft. All the data is, uh, first of all, the, the eBlaster reports are relayed, so we don't we don't store any data at Spectrosoft that's that's owned by the parent. Uh, the, the actual data itself that's uh, hosted on the computer can be pruned back, and we provide tools for doing that. So it's really a configuration uh, parameter. So, so it's largely stored on the client machine. Well, what? there there is no there is no client server approach here. I mean, this is the the pro product, the the user interface come, that the parent uses is on that computer, or they can install the viewer on a network like a local area network, but but that's just a viewer that's um, looking at shared files from that from the child's computer itself. So those, those files are resident there. eBlaster, again, is just a relay. Blair, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, Blair Richardson from Aristotle. This is to follow up on a question that was asked earlier uh, to the McGruff people, which is, uh, do you have a mechanism to facilitate uh, reporting of predatory contacts that uh, a parent discovers through the use of your product? Uh, no, we don't have a clearinghouse or, a, or any kind of uh, uh, you know, relationship like uh, the McGruff folks do, but we do uh, provide very detailed, uh, you know, insight into the, the communication that's that's ongoing. So a parent can look at our reports, and it says, "Johnny, let's go meet uh, at the park tomorrow at four o'clock," and then the parent can see that. And as a matter of fact, they could set up an alert, a keyword alert that says, "Meet me," or "Park," or "After school," okay, or "I'm your friend," or you know, it could be any kind of string and then immediately get an email alert. So they don't have to be looking through the logs all the time. It can just be you know, something that they're alerted on. And so it's really, we put the onus on the parent to uh, do that, because really the, the clearinghouses aren't foolproof. There, there could be, what if the predator has changed their, their identity? And they often do, frequently for that matter. And so in that case, you, the, nothing happened from the clearinghouse and you know, there, there you go. Um, the, the child's meeting the predator and there's nothing. I mean, the parent has to be more involved. I mean, figure this. You go to a mall with your child. Do you let them go? They're 10 years old, let's say. You don't let them go run around the mall and then meet them an hour later. Why would you let them on the internet unsupervised? It's the same exact logic. Sir. Uh, Ross Cohen, been verified. Because you're monitoring everything, at what point do you feel like your software is just counterproductive and you're forcing the children to just go to their friend's house where they're not being monitored? Well. When you say that, you know, go over to the friend's house, I, I've thought of that quite a bit. And, I, and if you're going, if your child is going to the friend's house, then you should know the parents of that friend. And you should have a nice long discussion with those parents to tell them the advantages of monitoring as well. So when they go over to the friend's house, the, their friend is also being monitored. I mean, this, again, it's education. Why let, why let your child go over to a house where they can be, uh, you know, access to the, what, the wild, wild west? It's the same thing as the mall analogy. Don't let them roam around the mall unsupervised. And, and, and then the other thing that was discussed earlier is this trust level between the child and the parent. You know, I think that that's really a, a, an age 
um, you know, the, the age of the child really is, is, is uh, key there. I mean, I'm going to let my 15-year-old uh, go to maybe some promiscuous sites now and then. I mean, he's a, he's a guy, right? <laughs> I'm going to let him grow up a little bit. You know, and back in my day, it was a Playboy magazine. Now it's uh, whatever. Okay, so let it, you give him a little leeway. But, the, you know, my 10-year-old, if I see him doing that, <laughs> he's probably going to miss dessert for a week. So it's all about good parenting. Larry, Maggie, last question, and then we will uh, take a short break. seem to have toned down your marketing, but for the longest time, you were promoting your products for spying on spouses. In fact, I'm looking at press releases where you specifically say that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether that's still part of your company's marketing. No, no, it isn't. I mean, you know, you evolve and you mature as a company and over time. And I think from an ethics standpoint, uh, we felt that that was just something we don't, we don't really want to promote. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, first of all, we... we uh, enforce the fact that the computer that uh, our software is installed on has to be owned by the individual that is installing it. So that's that's key. Uh, the thing well, I own the technically own my wife's computer. Okay, fine. You know, but but yeah. that that's something we're not preventing. I mean, we can't prevent you from doing that, but we're not encouraging you either. It's just it's just a matter of maturing as a company. We feel that that's probably not. So you have changed that aspect of your market. We have. Good. We don't thank talk you. about that a anymore. Great, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Okay. Great. Uh, hello and good afternoon and uh, thanks to the committee for inviting us to speak today. So Ethos Safe is uh, a Boston-based company. We actually have offices in Lexington, um, but so we're local folk. Um, and what we're um, really focusing on is that we too focus on online uh, content moderation um, and we're really trying to remove the risk of user-generated content. Our focus being um, to talk to brands about their social media programs. So for us, social media is um, online uh, forums, their blogs, their wikis, their uploads of content of any kind, videos and photos, in addition to social networks. But we're really focusing our attentions right now on how the brands, uh, mostly the large consumer brands, are using social media and therefore keeping those particular um, UGC programs um, safe in relation to the ethos of that brand. So for instance, there will be many brands who uh, will not necessarily um, have as high as standards about what um, is allowable in their uh, UGC programs, and there are um, other brands that will be very strict about that. So essentially, we provide a turnkey solution to moderate any kind of user-generated content and we are essentially a tagging and an analysis platform. So what we do is that we take content, a copy of content into Ethosafe, and we tag it um, so that we can understand if that content is appropriate for the um, uh, user-generated content or social, social media program that came. So our platform consists not only of technology, but of also human uh, reviewers. So we have a technology where we have a smart database where we store the content that we get from all of the clients who use our platform. That smart database can understand if it's seen the content before, and I'll tell you in a minute how we do that. Um, we also have a number of artificial intelligence components that is really doing the analysis. So we're doing simple things right now, um, word matching, um, spam filtering, profanity filtering, um, those kinds of um, understanding of text coming through. Um, that is the area that we will expand probably the most in our technology platform and that we can, because of the way the system is written, we can add all sorts of components um, into the um, technology platform so that um, we can analyze any kind of uh, content that comes through the system. We also have 24 by 7 highly trained reviewers. So this is how it works. So this is the tagging platform that is Ethosafe. So content comes into Ethosafe, and at first we generate a digital fingerprint for that content. So that content, if it comes into our system many times, um, which is what we have found in our studies, is that inappropriate content um, that is generated by users is frequently, the bad stuff is frequently the same. So you know, you know all about that, how it gets grassroots um, penetration and people pass it around. Um, so if it comes in to our system at any time, 
depending on where it comes from, if we've seen it, then that's going to uh, make this process much faster. So we generated a digital fingerprint for each piece of content that comes in. We check our smart database to see if we've seen it before. If we have seen it before and it can tag the content appropriately for the client, then we send a message back that says in version one it's a publish or no publish rule. Um, in later versions we can have any kind of variety of what happens with the um, instruction as it comes out of Ethosafe, but right now it's a publish and no publish rule. Um, if we don't see the content in the smart database, we'll have technology take a look at the, um, the content that comes in. And if the technology can tag it in some way, then it will also send back um, the, um, the instruction back to the program that it came from. So what, what we're trying to do here is that each client of ours has their own set of rules. So we have a set of tags, we have about 50 to 60 tags that, we, that are standard tags. They all have to do with appropriateness or, or inappropriateness. So they could be sexual content, they could be hate language, they could be any kind of violence, and that's really what we're looking for in this first version. So we're really focusing on safety. So our clients choose which tags they want that are allowable on their site or not. So certain, um, com certain um, brands would not want any of that kind of content ever on their site, and other brands will have a lot more tolerance for certain things. So what we're doing in this tagging platform is that we're tagging each piece of content that comes in, and then we're comparing it to the rules of uh, the client that we are working for. If the technology or the smart database cannot tag the content appropriately, then we will um, send it in front of human reviewers. So we have a platform and an interface for the human reviewers to do this very quickly. So it is an orchestration technology that comes in and presents this content right to, all, to our reviewers. And so it's a very quick, very um, fast process. And our differentiator here from other online content uh, moderation plays is that um, we look at all of the content and that we are really focusing on a somewhat smaller type of social media program. Um, we don't pretend to be able to handle all of MySpace or um, Facebook. We can handle a brand's portion of that. So if Adidas is putting up a Facebook page and they want it to be moderated, then we can moderate that for Adidas. Uh, but, we, but we are not trying to uh, boil the ocean with all of uh, Facebook and MySpace. We're really focusing on the brands. And these are the categories that the content is being tagged with. Um, so again, it's, it's really around safety. The system can handle any other kind of custom tags. So if, you, if a brand wants to um, do other kinds of tagging, we can do that. And we can do a publish or no publish rule on those as well. OK, any questions? Great, Michelle. Another great, concise presentation. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I don't know if MySpace or Facebook have ever been compared to the ocean before, but now they are. This is good. Who has a question for Michelle? Teresa. Bless you. Teresa Poloris from Polytechnic University of NYU. What sort of capabilities do you have to do that human moderation? You said that you had highly qualified people 24 by 7. I'm wondering, do you have people all over the world working uh, three shifts to, to do this? Yep, so actually um, we're using a, wor a virtual workforce model, so kind of a work-at-home model. Um, right now we're only covering the United States. We're, it, we're a beta product, essentially, so we're covering the United States and English only right now. Um, and so we will have reviewers in every time zone of the United States. Um, the way that we currently have it set up is that it's four-hour shifts. So we're really trying to attract the educated at-home worker um, who may have other responsibilities, for instance, uh, full-time mothers who, um, want, who can work during the day when their children are in school, or disabled people, or just people who want to work at home. And so people can work one shift or two shifts, but we will have um, enough people on board for 24 by 7 coverage. And Michelle, just when you say you're a beta product, you are, though, in use at this point? We are not uh, in use. We are no. currently looking for beta customers. Got it. Thank John, you. I just had a really quick follow-up question to that. Okay, How do you ensure the quality yep. uh, and consistency Good of question. the human reviewers? Right. So, 
So our system is really set up as a checks and balances. So we have supervisors on board who will also do, be doing spot checking. And the way that we have the, moder the reviewers set up is that um, we have uh, more reviewers than we need for each shift so that some frequently we send content through the system more than once so that we can check on tagging. Um, and so we, we're, we're trying to make sure that the content is seen by multiple people so that we can make sure that we are getting consistent tags. We also have a pre-testing, so in order to get hired, you have to show computer literacy, obviously, and also some other tests that our um, chief operating officer is, is providing. Thank you. Good questions. Others for Michelle? You go safe. Brian. Uh, Brian Levine from UMass Amherst. So yep. is it a technical limitation, or does it have to do with the fact that you're using human Human, a human workforce that you couldn't scale up to something the size of the largest social networking sites? Um, or is it a business decision? It's really kind of a business decision. We started the business to um, answer the needs of clients that we had, and it kind of really took off from there. Um, it's very hard to tell if um, the ethos of Facebook and MySpace in general can will actually embrace full across the board um, content moderating monitoring um, and it may not it may not be our job to do that there are other places that are doing and as um, KB who is one of our competitors mentioned earlier um, Facebook and MySpace are actually building those systems probably themselves so what we're really focusing on is helping brands move into the social media space um, do you mind if I ask another question Please, Brian. Thank you. Um, so given that you're going to have lots of customers that have their own sites with these different discussions and that you're going to look at user content, are you going to tag users across different sites? And if you do, where do you keep that information? Who is it available to? Is it deletable upon user request, et cetera, et cetera? Right. I'm going to have uh, Eric Marthenson, my chief architect, come up and answer that question. Sure. So um, the... No. Sorry. Um, so the content that comes in, um, are you talking about tagging content or users across sites or content exactly. across sites? Exactly, users. Content, tag, tagging users across sites and then... Yeah, we do, we do optionally capture um, information regarding the users that contribute content. So uh, the brand can pass through anything from a unique user ID, which is kind of site specific, to an email address, to a username. Um, and we can use that to try and trend across different sites. In the, beta, in the beta version, we're not doing that right now. We're just capturing the information. Um, but we do have that capability, and we do have the data store built for that. So do you plan to sell that information to, uh, to third parties? No. Would you notify those users if there was a, break, a breach of your security? Of our security? Yeah. We would probably pass that back to the, uh, uh, back to the brands. Uh -huh. we, we operate as a white label service. So to a large degree, we're invisible to, uh, to, to the end user. And what kind of information are you capturing about them? Is it just their email? Are you capturing their IP address and information? Uh, you know? Yeah, the specific fields that we're capturing um, would be a, a, a user ID, um, user ID, email address, IP address, um, and I think that's it. The, okay. um, all that information is optional, so the brand has control over whether they want to send that to us or not, and, um, and it is deletable upon user request. Upon your client's request, not the user request. Yeah. Okay. The user would never know of us, but. Right. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Other questions? John Morris. So, I'm going to yell it out. How long do you keep the data that you're going to capture on individual users? Uh, right now, indefinitely. Part of our it's an honest answer. There it is. Part of, part of our solution is that um, the smart database, which is keeping that content, and um, as future versions come out, we will also be in, doing analysis on that, like Bayesian filters and those kinds of things to make that database smarter so that when content comes in, we can recognize it more easily. Scott Bradner. So even Google is back down for, from forever, forever. Why are you starting out with forever? That seems to be a remarkably dumb thing to do. Yeah. Scott, Scott Bradner's email address? Oh, no, I won't even tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me what his car looks like. <laughs> the, um, you know, it, it, it might be. I think, I think one of the reasons that we're not uh, addressing a specific, a specific retention policy is because we haven't had any pushback about the fact that we do retain the data indefinitely. 
um, if that were to bubble up, I think we would address it. And we are starting to look at this more and more. Yeah, consider this pushback. Um, <laughs> Duly noted. But uh, you just said that the, the, the user would never know about it. I mean, they're a white label thing, so it's invisible. So unless you're part of your requirements is that the people you work for publicize to their, to their customers what's going on, they would never know, so you wouldn't have the opportunity to figure out how much people love it, if that's the right term. How much people love it. Yeah, yeah we, do, um, we do address the issue of transparency in our own, in our own documents. And um, I believe we, um, I would need to double check on this, but I believe part of our, our terms of service is that we ask for something to be included in the privacy policy regarding how they're moderating their content and our involvement. Um, so on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we're not communicating directly with a customer. Um, we would love it if the sites put a little, you know, made safe by Ethosafe badge on our site. We're not, you know, we're not uh, counting on that. But um, we do ask that they address our, our involvement in their privacy policy. Yeah, part of our, um, part of our contract with uh, the brands is that they would um, put that it is being moderated by a third party. Um, and so it would be in part of their privacy statement. Hi. Okay, one last question. Uh, just, Doug Krugman, uh, just for clarification. Doug, will you tell us, please? Uh, Doug Krugman, uh, Protocol Partners. Um, most of the data we're talking about here is publicly posted user-generated data. Yes. Uh, why are we so concerned about the privacy of this data? Right. I'm not, I'm not, why, why would we be concerned about that? If indeed it's, all, it's, it's, it's only that, it's not published in a, in, in a context um, which is uh, questionable, um, a private, quote, private space or something like that, then it's probably not an issue. But um, making, things, uh, make, making it clear as to what you're doing is an issue. Right, I agree with that. Um, and uh, it's, it's certainly a, it's a significant concern and has been expressed to be a significant concern of creating databases of people's actions that can later come back to haunt them. Yep, so just remember that we're not, um, um, there. I suppose you could say there were actions, but it is really the content that we're most interested in. Um, and so it is optional from the brand and from our clients to decide if we're also capturing this personal information about people. Um, so so if, if you allow me to add to that, Scott, uh, part of the problem is that they said they were collecting, you said you were collecting information from multiple sites of users who would not be linked otherwise. And so now my activities across the whole entire internet are in one database, and on one site I may have been I may have found it acceptable to give my email on another site. I may have posted an anonymous question, but now somehow I'm linked together. And, um, and especially if you're, if you're, you didn't say that you're not tracking children. So if you're tracking someone's activities when they become 18, it's still in this database forever. I'm somehow, then I'll go out for a job interview and I'll then ask this company to produce all the postings I ever had as a child and suddenly I'm responsible for things maybe I shouldn't be. Very helpful exchange. Do you guys want a final word on this and then uh, we'll sure. move to I could be that We. Um, our, our technology in terms of tracking users across sites is not particularly sophisticated. Um, you know, we're looking at email addresses, <coughs> usernames. So the only opportunity we would have to link somebody is if they use the same inform information. If somebody posts anonymously on one site and posts, um, you know, posts under a, a username on another site, we really can't match them up. We could try to do it by IP address, but that's extremely unreliable. So um, well, I would consider that to be junk data. It's pretty reliable, and a lot of the sites request an email address and then don't present it out in public, but you would have that information. and You'd have to keep a record of that. This was a site where, I just think you should yeah, keep it in mind. Yeah. No, I think that it's pretty important. Really good points, actually, because yeah, um, for us right now in our conversations with, um, with, the, with the clients that we're talking to, it isn't an issue for them. Um, and so we're, of course, catering to sort of getting the feedback from them, but this is a great conversation for us. I suspect to that too. some of the technical advisory board and others would be happy to give you a bit of free consulting on how long okay. data retention <laughs> policies ought to be. Um, well, it, sounds all right. like it, free. it does Please. sound like you have strong opinions about it. There are it, some so. good and strong opinions and lots yeah. of others at the Berkman Center who think long and hard about this who I'm sure would okay, be happy great. to talk to you about Excellent. it. Awesome. Please join me in thanking Ethos. Thank you.